So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Good morning, this is Robin Norgren. I am an art teacher and a, a curriculum writer, and you can find my work over at www.josiesartschool.com or at www.brightchildmontessori.com. Today, I'd like to start um, my series, um, Your Creative Peace, Find and Deepen Your Creative Voice While Connecting with God, by giving you a few questions to think about. When you think of the words declare joy, what does joy look like to you at this moment? Is God beginning to give you a deeper understanding of what the integration of art and devotion time to God would look like for you? Does your church encourage creative endeavors? And if so, how so? And are there some early pieces of work, creative practices, or exercises that you'd be willing to share with a friend or relative? Would you even consider sharing it in a public forum? What were the earliest memories of a creative passion that you had? How were you introduced to the process? And did you take to it quickly? What pathway of events led you to this discovery? Did you notice God in the process, and at what point? Describe the connection between the words amuse, A-M-U-S-E, and A-muse. I clearly imitated the artists I admire at first when I started my creative practice. I practice layering, I practice color, I did not really feel confident with how to mix color, and my drawing abilities had never been utilized up to this point. I shied away from drawing faces or hands or feet. A lot of times when I would venture on my own, it would take on that over-the-top feeling, but even in that, I was learning why too much or not enough paper or words or color would cause me to cross that fine line. My insecurities were still there, but I was having fun, and I was giving myself permission to try. My friend who had an Etsy shop was always very encouraging. She would encourage me to push the envelope. Why not use paint? Why not try drawing a face? Each each suggestion felt like an overwhelming challenge to my abilities. Could I do it? Would I at least let myself try? Still, I could not find my voice. I could not see that there might be room for me in the provincial creative pool. Art was for others. That's what I thought. My husband had gone to school for art, and both of my closest friends were trained and seemed to have incredible talent. My oldest son had always gravitated to art, and my daughter as well. And I encouraged this in their lives. Despite all these fears, I had this compulsion to keep trying, keep experimenting. I found myself not shrinking back as much. Fear is a big obstacle, right? When you're sitting quietly with God with whatever feelings and fears come up for you, ask God how he can help you turn those fears into intrigue or um, curiosity. How can he turn this hesitancy into excitement? How is fear showing up in your creative work? And what specifically is the fear about? How can you counter the fear? And what kind of training encouragement can you tap into to build credibility in your own mind and heart?
let's put the spotlight on Kelly Campbell. She's a photographer I met online, and she has some amazing work featured over at the zinniapatch.com. Someone once encouraged me to live, looking to behold the beauty of the Lord in all things. Those are the words from Psalm 27.4. Let me say it again. Someone once encouraged me to live, looking to beyond the beauty of the Lord, or to behold the beauty of the Lord in all things. Kelly says, when I seek his beauty in my every day, whether I am standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon or the whirlwind of laundry and toys in my living room, I have joy in my heart. I am more thankful. I let go of the frustration and exhaustion that daily comes with mothering. And he cares for me. And he gives me peace. She says, I like John Piper's statement that we live with single with a single, all-embracing, all-transforming passion, namely, a passion to glorify God by enjoying and displaying His supreme excellence in the sphere of life. Isn't that incredible? To live with a single, all-embracing, all-transforming passion, namely, a passion to glorify God by enjoying and displaying His supreme excellence in all spheres of life. That quote is actually from a book, Don't Waste Your Life. The Bible says that by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, Colossians 1.16, and that the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, Psalm 19.1. God was the first sculptor, shaping the mountains in human form, and the first musician giving songs to birds and cricket legs. He created movement and rhythm in ocean waves and wind through trees, while light and colors blend in the fleeting masterpiece that is each sunrise and sunset. He designed the first garden, and Genesis says it was pleasing to the sight and good for food. That's in Genesis 2.9. It was functional, yes, but it was also intended to be beautiful. In all these things, we see that God delights in his creation and knowing that we were created in his image. To know that he, we are made to be created is an understanding that we all should really think about. There's a book by Edith Shaper that says, The Hidden Art of Homemaking, and she talks about this very thing. Photography, according to Kelly Campbell, says, uh, Photography lets me capture and share God's images I see around me. I see them in big brown eyes looking up, in families holding hands, in new life sprouting from branches, and even sometimes in a pile of dirty dishes or a whirlwind of toys, abundant so easily taken for granted. As I seek to behold the beauty of the Lord, She says, he opens my eyes to it all around me, and often in unexpected places. So I keep my camera close. About her photography, Kelly says, I carried around a pink plastic 110 millimeter camera as a kid. I'm sure you had some version of the same. I still have a little album with its pictures. A family camping trip on the Frio River in Texas. A week at summer camp in Colorado and some odds and ends photos of school friends, most of them yellow and dark with subjects off-center and heads cut off. I love to take pictures with the Hipstamatic app on my iPhone, and it strikes me as funny that in this age of Photoshop and almost too perfect pictures, we have begun artistically adding the bad photo effects to, of generations past. She says, I first learned to use an SLR when I stumbled into a photojournalism class in high school. I learned to manipulate apertures and shutter speeds for multiple results on one subject. I rolled my own film in the scary pitch black darkness of a high school darkroom. Teachers with dark rooms must be either the bravest of souls or simply out of their minds. I swished my prints and chemicals and marveled at the ghostly black and white images as they appeared. The whole process of creating a photo from start to finish fascinated me and I was hooked. Growing up, Kelly says her dad had used an old Pentax SLR that he bought in the 60s, 
often setting it up on a tripod for family portraits in the backyard. Around the time she left for college, she says, I acquired that Pentax, or maybe just walked off with it. I used it as often as I could afford, given my college budget of less than nothing. The single factor that held me back for so many years was the cost of film and prints, prints that were terrible more often than not. As a student and later, a young military wife with a new Nikon N80 in my bag, my expensive hobby was never quite a budgeting priority. When my son was born in 2004, she says, I made the switch to digital. We bought a 3.2 megapixel Sony Cybershot and everything changed. The option to view pictures in camera or on my computer as well as delete without ever spending a cent rocked my world. I began taking photos by the thousands, literally. Even with such limited point-and-shoot capacities, I learned a lot about composition and lighting. Friends began asking me to take their family photos, and I became the go-to mom for pictures. At playdates and the pumpkin patch. When people began to exclaim things like, you take your pictures with that little thing, I knew it was time to move up. One April, when he was in Iraq, my husband wished me happy birthday by email and instructed me to order a camera. A Nikon D300 had been close by my side ever since, and my hobby has become something of a way of life, a way for me to not forget the things that my eyes have seen so they do not depart from my heart all the days of my life so I can make them known to my children and my grandchildren. Deuteronomy 4.9 Thanks so much for stopping by. Like I said, this is from a series called My Creative Peace, Find and Deepen Your Creative Voice While Connecting with God. I wrote this book back in um, 2013, um, but it was actually a work in pro process, progress <laughs> when I started looking for my own creative voice back in 2009. I thought for my 10th anniversary that I would take the time and um, just share some of the entries from this um, course, and it is in, um, in a soft cover and available on my website. Thanks so much for stopping by. Make sure to share it with someone you think would really enjoy this podcast.